Okay. So what I'd like to cover today is um, just to kind of recap where we've been and where we are heading now. So in the first part of the course, what we did was talk about the foundation for auditing in terms of um, designing the audit approach. So what is going to inform the auditor in terms of uh, inherent risk, control risk, fraud risk? Um, how do they gather information to be able to assess that type of risk, those different risks uh, or to perform those different risk assessments, and we talked about understanding the client, understanding the client's business and the industry that the client operates in, and determining what factors are going to impact inherent risk or what factors are going to impact fraud risk, for example. So think about going through the Pinnacle case just now. Uh, you had information that you gathered in part two of the case with the various scenarios. And in part two, what you looked at is how those different scenarios would impact inherent risk or, or acceptable audit risk, right? And then in the fourth part of the case, you use those same scenarios and thought about, well, what, how does that impact? Is, first of all, is it a uh, fraud risk indicator? And if it is, what element of the fraud triangle is impacted by these scenarios? So now we start to move in to the actual audit testing. So we've gathered this information, right? We've, we've made our risk assessments, and now we have to, we, based on that, we're going to develop our audit procedures. What audit procedures are we going to perform? Because we've identified those accounts with their potential misstatements. So in the Pinnacle case, just now, you, most people talked about accounts receivable. There's a concern about fictitious uh, sales, perhaps and the impact that it would have on accounts receivable or inventory, the inventory obsolescence reserve. So going forward, we start to look at actually performing our audit test. What's the purpose of performing our audit test or audit procedures? Why are we doing it? Because we want to get paid? What are they paying us for? Assurance. Right? What kind of assurance? Reasonable assurance. Yeah, we're giving assurances about what? Financial statements, right? Because you can give different types of assurances, but we're giving assurances about the financial statements. We're giving assurances that the financial statements are what? Free of material misstatement. Okay, so that was the quiz. So let's talk about audit procedures. So remember the phases of the audit we talked about much earlier, okay, when we talk, started talking about the approach to the audit. And we talked about it when we were talking about understanding the client's business. We do that so that we can plan and design an audit approach. So all of those things that we did, risk assessment, uh, the, you know, assessment of inherent risk, assessment of control risk, assessment of fraud, understanding the client's business, all of that was to help us plan our approach to the audit. Understand the client so that we can plan and design an audit approach. When we talk about internal controls, we talked about assessing internal control, internal control risk so that we could determine what impact that would have on our audit detect, on our a detection risk, which would have an impact on the amount of evidence that we collected or would need to be able to, to provide an opinion on the financial statements. So what we're going to cover in the next few phases, two and three, will be the performing a test of controls. We've assessed con control risk. Now we're going to perform a test of controls and substantive test of transactions. So testing the transactions uh, that give rise to the amounts that are reflected in the financial statement. Part three, we're going to talk about performing analytical procedures. In the planning phase, we talked about analytical procedures as a way of trying to identify where there were potential misstatements. So if you think back to the first part of the Pinnacle case, you did ratio analysis. You looked at changes between uh, peer, the first th year one to year two to year three and identified where there could be potential misstatements. That's the analytical procedures performed during the planning phase. We'll talk a little bit about analytical procedures that you can use during the uh, testing phase. And then testing of detailed balances would represent those balances uh, in the financial statements. So on one hand, you're looking at transactions that give rise to those balances, and you're going to also test balances. 
better in the financial statements. And then in the last uh, couple of weeks of the course, we'll talk about the completing the audit process, which includes issuing the audit report and then also kind of doing this subsequent event review um, to determine um, if there are any items that impact the financial statements um, that happened after year end. So that'll be the last phase that we covered during the last couple of weeks of the class. So this should also look familiar because it was an exam question. So phase one, as I said, we talked about this in terms of accepting the client um, and doing initial uh, planning or co client continuance. So you should remember these steps from chapter eight, right? This is what we did. We, we performed planning procedures by trying to get an understanding of the client's business in the industry, assessing what the client's business risk was and how that would impact audit risk, and performing preliminary analytical procedures. So again, that was the basis for the auditor's risk assessment to determine, so remember the audit risk model. Inherent risk and control risk represent what? What does it represent? When we combine those two things together, it represents what? Think about what inherent risk, what's inherent risk? Hmm? Well, the, it, it's risk that could lead to potential fraud or errors, but what is inherent risk? Does the auditor control inherent risk? Yes. So it's related to company factors, right? Uh, factors about company, factors about management that could have, so it's not, uh, so is management integrity something that we can put a number to? No, we can't put a number to it, right? But it, it, there are factors about management, factors about the company that could increase an auditor's risk. And so an auditor has to control for that risk. And when I say control for it, control for it in the sense that developing the appropriate amount of audit procedures to address that risk. What's control risk? Speak up. It's better that I know the answer so that we can all know if it's the right answer and I can give you the right answer if it's not. What's control risk? What's control? Let's start there. Okay, too many shots on spring break? That's what it does to your brain. Wipes out your memory. What are controls? Well, that's an example of a control. Internal controls are that's that that's a that's a it's a component that's a control activity. The book is in front of you, so you might want to just turn to chapter 10 and look up controls. Everybody has the book. It's not on my forehead, I can promise you. I want you to tell me what controls are. Good, good thing I don't do pop quizzes. <laughs> Especially after spring break. Anybody find it yet? Just look in the glossary. I'm trying to wake you up. That's what I'm making you look at for it. There you go. The risk that the client's and system of internal controls will fail to prevent or detect errors or irregularities in the financial statement. That's all it is, right? So the inherent risk and the control risk represents the risk of material misstatement. What are we concerned about as auditors? We're concerned that the financial statements are materially misstated. We, you want to, the opinion is geared towards assuring third party users that the financial statements are free of material misstatements. Inherent risk, control risk, the auditor has no control over. Those are client driven risks. So the best that the auditor can do is assess those risks. 
And depending on the auditor's knowledge gained during this, this part or phase of the audit is how they're going to assess those two different types of risk that together make up the risk of material misstatement. And that will impact their audit plan and their overall audit approach. So remember in Chapter 9, we talked about determining, what mater determining the materiality. Right? Everyone remembers what materiality is? Somebody Google it. Audit materiality. Exactly. It's the amount. It's a judgment, right? The amount that would alter a reasonable person's uh, uh, actions, right? That it would make a difference to a reasonable person. So that's the basis of materiality or de definition from a financial statement perspective. So how do we determine materiality? Based on what? Quantitatively, qualitatively? Both, right? So we, d we start out initially, which is what we talked about in Chapter 9, setting materiality. And initially, it's going to be quantitatively. It's going to be based on some factor, uh, some uh, basis of net income or operating income or total assets. And what's going to drive the base that's used is the business, right, or it, the characteristics of that company. Once we set the materiality limit, at the quantitative limit, we also have to consider as adjustments arise before we can say that it's immaterial, we also have to consider the qualitative aspect of that adjustment. So for example, will that adjustment cause the company to miss earnings forecast, analyst forecast? Will it cause them to now have a net loss? So we look at the qualitative factors, because even though it can be quantitatively immaterial, we know that it could be qualitatively material. So the auditor assess the materiality because they have to that they're going to find adjustments in the financial statements. You don't want to book adjustments that are not material. That's not going to affect the reasonable user's decision. So which is why you set the materiality and you determine what your acceptable audit risk is and your inherent risk as well. Right? The auditor's acceptable audit risk is the risk that the auditor is willing to take that what? That risk defines what? Well, I think I know where you're going. It's not so much they're allowed to have, but there's the risk that the auditor, right, in, a, in a nutshell, the risk that the auditor is willing to take that the financial statements are incorrect even though they issued a, a, a clean opinion, an unqualified opinion. So you could imagine the auditor's not willing to take a lot of risk because of the consequences of that decision, right? So that's what the auditor controls, is the acceptable audit risk. And they control that by gathering information, right, and evidence. So they control it through the evidence collection process. They want to keep that risk low. Everything else being equal, they're going to want to look at evidence. Right? They want more evidence. So, for example, if the control risk is high, an inherent risk is high, the auditor is going to want to look at a lot more evidence to get that, to keep audit risk low. Chapter 10, we talked about con internal controls and assessing control risk. Again, the auditor is going to perform procedures like talking to management, doing walkthroughs, reviewing prior p uh, work papers. Um, if, if it's a, uh, an existing or continuing client to assess control risk. We also talked about fraud risk. You saw this in your pinnacle case, the process that the auditor would go through to assess what the fraud risk is. We don't really talk about, we didn't talk about this a lot, but uh, oh, we didn't do a brainstorming activity necessarily, but brainstorming is a big part of SAS 99 where the audit team gets together. So if you thought about your exercise as a group, one of the things you should have been doing is getting together and talking through the different fraud risks um, that existed or you believe existed at Pinnacle. 
um, and then develop the overall audit plan and program. So that's where we are moving from today. In terms of phase two, summary of the audit process is to look at what your plans are to reduce your assessed level of control risk. What are the plans? So if you can rely on internal controls, so this is basically saying, I can rely on internal controls. Yes. If I can rely on internal controls, now let me test them. If, I, if my initial assessment is control risk is real, relatively low, I believe I can rely on internal controls, therefore I'm going to test controls. I'm performing those tests and controls in conjunction with substantive testing transactions. Because remember, your internal controls or your internal control procedures are your procedures over transactions. So you, a lot of times, most times, the test of controls and substantive test of transactions are performed uh, at the same time concurrently. Then you assess the likelihood of misstatements in the financial statements based on the results of your testing of controls and of substantive test of transactions. Now, if you've said that you can't rely on internal controls, right, so maybe in your control risk assessment you rated this as high. So it's a high, high internal control risk. So basically internal controls are not effective. So if internal controls are not effective, you're not going to rely on them. So you're not going to test them. What's the point in testing something you can't rely on? So you then look at, you increase your substantive testing. You're going to do a lot more substantive testing. You're going to look at a lot more documentation over the various transactions that occurred. And then from there, assess whether or not, again, there's a, a likelihood of misstatement. Um, phase three then goes to looking at test the balances, right? And so you could test balances by doing analytical procedures. You saw that in the planning phase. Right, where you looked at the changes and you formed expectations. So based on your understanding of the client, you have expectations about how the uh, accounts should behave or w how the, what the numbers should look like right? and, uh, and understanding what the relationships are. So for example, um, in Pinnacle, I keep going back to this one, but we saw that accounts receivable was way up. Uh, it was up very high over previous years where sales wasn't. That doesn't seem to make sense because there's a relationship between sales and accounts receivable. Right? So you would expect that you would see a, the, them moving together. Okay, so because accounts receivable was up, that gave you concern about whether or not there was uh, obsolescence, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, concerns about their allowance for doubtful accounts. Right? So in this, in, but when you're performing analytical procedures in the test, uh, in the testing phase, um, you would not perform analytical procedures on that, like right, alone. You would do additional testing. That would tell you that because there's a chance for potential misstatements. So analytical procedures are not going to tell you anything. You, you need more detailed information. The other thing about analytical procedures, usually if companies have a very strong internal control system, and the risk of material misstatement is extremely low based on the auditor's assessment, that's where you'll see them possibly use more analytical procedures. Because analytical procedures are only as good as your expectations that you form around, those, around the company. So it's how well do you understand the company's business in order to, uh, to uh, uh, come up with realistic uh, rep expectations. Uh, perform, perform tests to key items that you select from based on your understanding of the client, and then perform some additional testing of the balances, such as uh, uh, current uh, looking at cash, looking at accounts payable, looking at long-term debt. Those are all uh, detail account balances, testing procedures that you would perform. Um, and then in the final phase, as I said, this is when we are in the process of completing the audit. So remember, when we talked about assertions in Chapter 6, I believe, when we talked about assertions, we said that there are three categories of assertions that auditors develop audit-related objectives for. What are those three categories of assertions? That would be Chapter 6. Right. 
Yep. Yep. So we have three categories of this, this assertions that, ma that auditors develop uh, audit-related objectives, transactions, detail account balances, and presentation and disclosure. So in, in phases two, um, and I'm sorry, in phases, yeah, phases two and three, we, uh, we looked at transactions and assertions related to transactions and assertions related to detail account balances. When we get to phase four is when we look at the assertions related to presentation and disclosure because at this point we've pretty much done all of the detailed testing on the financial statement transactions. Now you want to look at how are they presented in the financial statement. Right. So this is as we get toward uh, completing the audit. Accumulating whatever final evidence. So we'll talk about things when we get to this the last couple of weeks of class, this is where we're going to look at subsequent events. Are there any major things that happened after year end that would change the opinion of the user of the financial statement for the uh, 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 period ending, uh, the financial statement period end, right? So is there something, so for example, did a major customer go bankrupt, right? Even though that happened after year end, it has an impact on a user's perception of that company. Uh, evaluate those results, issue the audit report, and then we have to discuss with the audit committee and management. Uh, communicate with them regarding the audit. So let's talk about the different, I mentioned that the different types of tests, we did risk assessment, um, procedures which assess the risk of material statement. So we did all of that in phase one, where we look at the audit risk model, we look at materiality, we look at clients' business risk. In addition to that, the detailed tests or the testing further audit procedures that we do are the four things that I just mentioned. Test the controls, substantive test the transactions, analytical procedures, and test the detailed balances. Those are what we call further audit procedures where we're testing in a, a more detailed information. So if you look at that in terms of the audit risk model, um, test the controls, control, we'll, we're looking to assess control risk um, and test the controls are at, that we can, that the assessment that we've assigned with respect to control risk is appropriate. So we're gonna test the controls, substantive test the transactions, also, as I pointed out, your controls are controls over your transactions. Um, so you're going to perform those tests concurrently in most cases. Analytical procedures, test the detailed balances. Um, all of these tests, the objective is to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence. Right? That's what you're trying to do to support your opinion. It's extremely important for auditors to be able to support the opinion that they give because you never know, first of all, for public um, auditors of publicly held companies, the PCAOB can come in at any time that they want and inspect your work. They tend to focus on uh, those audit clients that would be considered high risk. Okay. So you definitely, as an auditor, you want to make sure that you're able to support your opinion. And evidence collection is the way that we do that, that they do that. Um, so just uh, quickly, the test of controls, again, is going to evaluate whether the controls um, over transactions are sufficiently effective because you want to reduce the, you want to reduce control risk, right? You want to make sure, because you, your initial assessment, right, you, you're really basing it on your knowledge of the client's business, their systems, um, the, it, it's a continuing client, previous history with that client in terms of controls. Uh, walkthrough of the controls, discussion with management, but you really only know that those tr controls are working once you go through the testing phase, once you actually test them. Um, also, with Sarbanes-Oxley, auditors under 404 are required to issue, an, issue a report on internal controls. So you can issue a report if you haven't done the appropriate amount of tests. As I pointed out before, right, if you can't rely on controls, 
then you're probably going to, you're definitely going to do more substantive testing, right? So there is this trade-off between tested controls and substantive testing. If you can rely on internal controls and you assess that internal control risk is very low, then the transactions happen the same way all the time. Your controls should happen the same way all the time. So you can rely more on your test of controls to reduce your substantive testing of transactions. So substantive t um, transactions are looking to test the dollar misstatement, possible dollar misstatements. Controls are looking to determine whether or not controls are operating as intended, that those controls are effective to detect or prevent errors in the or irregularities or misstatements in the financial statements. Whereas substantive testing, you're looking at the dollar, uh, testing for dollar misstatements. Uh, when we talked about, in Chapter 6, we talked about assertions. We talked about the fact that auditors map their audit objectives to the assertions. So if you remember, when we talked about occurrence, for example, under sales, what would be an audit objective there? What's the audit objective related to occurrence? First of all, what does occurrence tell us? What, does that, what is management asserting to when they assert the occurrence? Right, that all the sales that are reflected in the financial statements actually occurred. What's the audit objective? Now, completeness is an assertion that management makes, right, as well. But what, what is the auditor? What does the auditor want to know? Right, that sales occur that it happened, it occurred, right? Is it? I mean, so and so now, how would the auditor test that? What would be a procedure? How would they determine? Somebody gave me the answer when they went over Pinnacle, so I know they know it. How would you test? that sales occurred, that they're valid, that all the sales that are reflected in the financial statements are valid sales. No, because we're accrual basis, so you don't want to wait until you receive the cash. What, what determines a sale? Shipping documents, right? That's what generates, so a test would be to look at shipping documents. That would tell you that the sale occurred. If it shipped, right, it occurred. Were you going to say that? Okay. So again, we're going to take all of those, and it doesn't matter. Again, the assertions are the assertions regardless of the cycle, regardless of the transaction. These assertions are the same, right? It's going to be occurrence. It's going to be completeness going to be accuracy, it's going to be cutoff. Those are going to be the assertions regardless of the transaction. The audit-related objectives are going to be, uh, depending on the transaction, a slight difference, but basically they're the same. Your audit procedures are what's going to change because your, the documentation that's going to be required is going to be different for each uh, cycle. As I pointed out, analytical procedures are based on the auditor's expectations, and those expectations are only as good as the auditor's initial understanding or complete understanding of the client's business in, uh, in the industry. And then the test of detail balances basically looks at the accounts in the general ledger, balance sheet, and income statement accounts. And so those are what uh, the auditor combines to have um, uh, an appropriate evidence mix. So just, I just want to point out, in terms of the evidence mix, the, the, the amount of, or, or the level of these various audit procedures are going to be just driven by the uh, company, in terms of the complexity of the company, uh, things like the company's internal control environment, and so forth. So for example, if you look at client one, uh, audit one, is test of controls is extensive. Uh, substantive tests of transactions, small analytical procedures are extensive, tests of balances are small. So they're, el they're actually looking at few transactions, uh, few balances, but they're relying very heavily on internal controls because they're doing extensive testing of internal controls and analytical procedures. 
that tells us that client one is probably a large company with sophisticated internal controls that are effective and, um, and low inherent risk. So therefore, the risk of material misstatement, internal controls and inherent risk, is extremely low. So as a result of that, the auditor can rely extensively on internal controls with, with um, smaller level of testing of transactions and balances. Um, as compared to, let's say, client number three, where there's no testing of internal controls, extensive substantive testing and uh, uh, test of detail balances. So they're looking at a lot of documentation, a lot of transactions, a lot of balances, and only moderate um, testing or medium testing uh, with respect to analytical procedures. What that tells us is that client three is a medium-sized client, perhaps, but has few effective internal controls. Because here you see the auditor is not relying on them. So that should tell you there that the internal controls are not effective. Um, and a significant amount of inherent risk. So the risk of material misstatement, internal control risk and inherent risk, much higher in this case. So the auditor is going to do a lot of detailed testing of transactions and account balances. So that's how the complexity of the client and their, uh, their assessment of control and inherent risk will impact the auditor, the, the level of each of these procedures, audit procedures the auditor would use or the evidence mix. Just quickly, the audit program, and all, you know, every firm you go to have their own audit program, but those, the audit program is driven by the requirements under GAAP or generally accepted auditing standards. The things that the auditor, at a minimum, it has to comply with GAAP. Um, test the controls and substantive testing, analytical pre procedures, and then the test of details and balances. So all of the procedures, this is based on a, 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 a cycle approach, um, looking at the, uh, the auditor in this case is trying to satisfy the balance related audit objectives. So for each cycle, you'll evaluate these various um, steps in the audit program. Uh, already talked about the transaction related audit objective. Uh, remember those from six, uh, chapter six, and this is key. We're going to keep going back to assertions. We're gonna keep going back to transaction related audit objectives. We're gonna keep going back to control, right? Because we're gonna cover those when we talk about revenue and expenditure. Now we're gonna put those in the context of revenue related accounts and expenditure related accounts. And so the steps that the auditor performs is to apply the transaction related audit objectives to, to class of transactions, identify what the key controls are, make a preliminary control risk assessment. Based on that, design your test of controls and design your substantive test of transactions. And remember, there's a trade off between these two depending on the level of controls that the auditor can rely on. The evidence decisions or the decisions that the auditor has to make with regard to each of these is what audit procedures they're going to perform, what sample size they will uh, need, if there are any uh, items they're going to select uh, outside of the, uh, random sampling or statistical sampling, and then when they perform those procedures. Um, in terms of the test of balances, you basically did this when you looked at uh, the, in, in part two of the pinnacle case, or part one, where you looked at where there was a potential for misstatement. So using the client's information to identify what specific account uh, there's a possibility for material misstatement. And, and we saw in pinnacle, accounts receivable was one, inventory was another. Set the tolerable misstatement, which is based off of you have your overall materiality, your preliminary planning materiality. You allocate that materiality to the various accounts. That's your tolerable misstatement. Um, again, look at, assess what the control risk is related to that. So what is the control risk related to, for example, accounts receivable? If you're going to use analytical procedures, design and perform those analytical procedures, and then design and perform um, all of the uh, test of controls and transactions related to, say, for example, the revenue cycle that would impact accounts receivable, um, and then uh, adjust your procedures as necessary. Um, same uh, approach that you're going to use 
what you will see going through each of these, the key, one of the key things is materiality, chapter 9, inherent risk, and acceptable audit risk from the audit risk model on client business risk in chapter 8 when we talked about understanding the client's, this, um, a client's entity. Always going back to applying the, looking at the assertions, categories of assertions, and applying your uh, balance related audit objectives to those um, in order to ensure that you are addressing those accounts where you have the risk of material misstatement. Okay? So again, is your, your procedures are going to be the same, the same procedures, the same approach. Your, your audit, obviously, if you're auditing sales, you're, you're concerned about um, overstatement, right, or fictitious sales, versus if you are auditing uh, accounts payable, you're concerned more about understatement of liabilities or understatement of expenses. Okay, so your, your, your concerns are, or risks are different, but your approach to auditing those accounts are going to be very, the overall procedures are the same. So we, this is just an overview that, so when we start to talk about revenue next week, auditing revenue, we're going to cycle back to this approach of how we establish our audit procedures.